grand dance of our universe is a breathtaking vision. Stars parade across the sky in lockstep, night after night. The galaxies spin, vast cities of stars bound together to create stunningly elegant forms. Until recently, our own lifetime, we couldn't hope to answer the most basic questions about the cosmos. Has the universe always been here? Did it have a beginning? I first encountered those grand mysteries as a nine-year-old kid. We came here on a field trip to the Hayden Planetarium. It looked a lot different then, but that first trip changed my life. More or less on the spot, I decided to become an astrophysicist, even though I could barely pronounce the word. And now, all grown up, I've returned to the Hayden as its director. And over that time, our understanding of the universe has been transformed again and again. Astronomers had long believed that our cosmos had always existed, eternal and unchanging. In its last version, the idea even had a name, the steady state theory. But that was really just an assumption. And like so much received wisdom in science, it would ultimately be proved wrong by accident. The breakthrough came in the early days of the space race. In 1962, astronauts were heroes. And for a while, America went space crazy. Space even made the charts when the song Telstar, named for the first satellite to transmit transatlantic phone calls, rocketed up to number one. The real Telstar satellite was built by AT&T, the phone company. Telstar was the first link in a truly global communications network. But there were a few bugs in the system, especially an annoying hiss in those early calls relayed by satellite. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? AT&T engineers wondered if the problem might lie in the way Telstar communicated with Earth, using a form of energy called microwaves. Telephones are actually very simple machines. They all work in pretty much the same way. Hello? Hey, it's your boss. No, I'm kind of busy now. Can, can you call back later? Oh. Uh, hang, on, hang, hang on a sec. What they do is they convert sound waves into electrical impulses, and then take those same electrical impulses and convert them back into sound waves at the other end of the line. I gotta go, I'm, I'm working here, all right? Okay, then. Let's talk later, but thanks for calling. Love you. Bye. Satellites take this one step further. They convert the electrical impulses into forms of light we call microwaves and radio waves. To get a handle on that, let me introduce you to my cosmic tuner. It's sensitive to all forms of light there are. Most familiar is visible light with its rainbow of colors. What makes one color different from the next is simply its wavelength. And I can use this knob to tune one wavelength to the next. Let's start with violet. It has the shortest of all wavelengths. Moving to longer and longer wavelengths, we pass from one color to the next, right on up to orange and then red. There ends visible light. But light continues beyond that. Just increase the wavelength. And what do you get? Infrared. Can't see infrared, but we feel it. We sense it as heat. Beyond infrared, we find microwaves. And then the longest of them all, radio waves. Both radio waves and microwaves we use to communicate through Earth's atmosphere and through space itself. As it happens, almost everything in the night sky emits energy in the form of these same micro and radio waves. Here is the Milky Way photographed in visible light. 
And here is its image at radio wavelengths. After World War II, this new way of looking at the sky launched the field of radio astronomy. And now, it would lead to a phenomenal discovery. Robert Wilson and Arno Penzias were both experts in the new fields of radio and microwave astronomy. And in 1964, AT&T's Bell Labs asked them to help figure out what might be causing the annoying hiss in satellite communications. To do so, they began their detective work with this giant antenna that could receive signals from Telstar. To test the instrument, they pointed it at an empty patch of sky. Aiming at nothing, they expected to find nothing. Instead, to their surprise, they picked up a faint microwave signal, apparently coming from empty space. Sure that couldn't be right, they looked for any possible source of stray microwaves. They even climbed into the horn to clean up after a pair of unwelcomed guests. When was the last time we were in here? Yeah, 38 years 65 ago. 65 or 64. There'd been a pair of pigeons living there and uh, deposited pigeon droppings inside, and that was clearly a possible uh, microwave loss material. As a graduate student, I did worse things. And you probably did oh, too. Yeah. yeah, you just do what you have to do. You do what you have to do every day. Probably best to plant your left foot. Nothing worked. The hiss was still there. And mysteriously, it seemed to be coming from wherever they looked in the sky. We could by then rule it out that it came from the horn itself. We were unaware of anything in the sky that should do it, and we thought the horn should not be picking up anything from the ground. It just was uh, sort of surreal. It, uh, it didn't fit our idea of physics. But the microwave hiss, so perplexing to Penzias and Wilson, did fit a radical idea being explored by a group of physicists just 40 miles down the road in Princeton, New Jersey. The Princeton team was trying to prove that our entire universe had actually been born in a tremendous burst of energy billions of years ago. Team leader Bob Dickey believed that some of that energy should still be detectable as a faint hiss of microwaves in space. To test that hunch, Dickey asked a young postdoc named David Wilkinson to set up this miniature antenna in his spare time. We weren't in any particular hurry because Bob Dickey's idea was so original. We weren't too worried about somebody else getting there before we did. We went down to Arch Street in Philadelphia and dug around in the World War II surplus uh, shops to find uh, things that were cheap. But before their instrument was up and running, Word reached Penzias and Wilson, who gave Dickey a call. He hung up the phone, and I'll never forget exactly what he said. These are his exact words. He said, well, boys, we've been scooped. Scooped indeed to the greatest discovery in cosmology, the Big Bang. In the Big Bang, 